Good afternoon. Um, this session is, real, is uh, all about what you have helped us to achieve. Um, these, are our, these are our scientists that we've awarded grants to, and I want you to be kind and forgiving because many of them have never presented to patients before. They're used to speaking in a scientific language, and I've asked them to sort of bring it down to a level that we can understand. So I've also explained I may interrupt them occasionally if I feel like the language is just not getting translated across, but it's, this is really an incredibly bright group, and they're going to be changing the face of mesothelioma. So I'd like to start with Dr. Teo Dow from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Dr. Dow, thank you. Uh, and I'm not going to do full introductions because we have all the bios in the booklet, so for sake of time. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice introduction, and thank you very much for having me here, and thank you very much for your generous donation, which allows us to do this very interesting study. So my topic today is uh, about targeting the untargetable with antibodies, uh, uh, using a therapeutic human TCR-like antibody to the intracellular oncoprotein WT1. So uh, immunotherapy mainly works through uh, two major mechanisms. One is cytotoxic T lymphocyte that will target intracellular antigen, and the other one is uh, all the therapeutic antibody will target the cell surface uh, antigen. So here I want to explain the all the cancer cells overexpress certain protein. Uh, we immunologists call it uh, tumor antigen. So how the cytotoxic T lymphocyte work uh, to kill the uh, cancer, cancer cells? So, oh, sorry. So I can't really do this. OK, the cancer cells, you can see in this green big cells, uh, it, inside of cells, there are uh, millions of protein. And, uh, but those protein can be uh, naturally processed uh, to the peptide, which is a uh, fragment of the protein. And that can be presented by MHC class one, uh, which express in all nuclear cells. So this complex will be recognized by cytotoxic CD8 T cells through T cell receptor, we call it TCR. So once the CTL recognize this complex on the target cells, then it will have a mechanism to kill the tumor cells. So this is the structure of an antibody. It is a large Y-shaped protein. And the two end, uh, this, uh, I don't know how to use this. The, in, the, in the red and the blue end uh, are antigen binding sites. The recognition and the binding to the antigen is very specific. And at the bottom, there's one circle, we call it FC portion, which bind to the immune effector cells, which include all sorts of cells, like natural killer cells, macrophage, neutrophils. And uh, here is one of the antibody mechanism. We call it antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So if you see this big red uh, tumor cells, so it, on the surface, there is a lot of protein, and uh, some of them we call tumor antigen. So this antibody uses two ends to bind these target cells. And uh, then the uh, FC portion will bind to the effector cells uh, through the FC receptor, which express in all sorts of effector cells. So when this antibody bridge effector cell to the target tumor cells, then effector cells can kill the target by a lot of different mechanisms. Oh, I lost those. Interestingly, the word. This needs to go to the word, and it needs to go back. To OK. OK. No, I think when I, uh, OK, sorry. So this, I just have shown this ADCC mechanism, how it kills target cells. And then the, the other one is uh, we call complement-dependent cytotoxicity. So when this antibody binds to the tumor cells, it will activate uh, a, a protein called complement. 
and the complement can lyse the tumor cells. And the other one here is called uh, antibody-dependent uh, cyto uh, cellular phagocytosis. Uh, again, it is uh, mm, mediated by antibody. When antibody bind the tumor cells, and the tumor cell can be phagocytosed by the macrophage, and the macrophage can digest tumor cells or produce some chemical to kill tumor cells. So this I will skip. So the other mechanism of antibody uh, is uh, it can directly block the signal uh, of the tu the, this antigen and also can directly induce the cell death, we call it apoptosis. And uh, if this antibody are not potent enough by itself, so we can also conjugate other toxin drug to the antibody and also can uh, conjugate uh, uh, radiation. So it will deliver specifically to, to uh, a lot more potent cytotoxic agent to kill the tumor cells. So this is a list of uh, successful antibody drug uh, that have been proved by FDA. So I think the first one is uh, rituximab, which is anti-CD20 antibody. And uh, here I just want to uh, emphasize is all those antibody recognize cell surface protein, like uh, the cartoon I showed in the previous slide. So why we target uh, WT1? Uh, its whole name is called Wilm tumors, which is originally identified in a childhood uh, renal tumor. Um, uh, WT1 is an uh, intracellular oncoprotein, which has very limited expression in normal tissue. However, it overexpresses in a wide range of leukemias, leuke leukemia stem cells, especially in mesothelioma and other solid tumors such as uh, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, and the colon cancer. And also this expression of WT1 correlated with remission and the prognosis of the disease. So most importantly uh, is WT1 is a highly validated target for T cell therapy. And they have, there are s several um, epitopes derived from WT1 that have been shown uh, to be processed and presented to the T cells. So the immunotherapy targeting WT1 has been pretty much uh, aimed at ger generating a cytotoxic T lymphocyte. The reason is, as I mentioned, it is a nuclear protein and it cannot be accessed by the traditional classical antibody which only recognizes three-dimensional protein on the cell surface. So to generate T cell based therapy, there are several approaches. For example, we can make a peptide vaccine, which is the synthesized uh, small protein fragment derived from the WT1. Then you can immunize a, a patient to generate T cell response. So similarly, and you can load on those peptides to the one of the most potent antigen presenting cells we call dendritic cells. And uh, uh, infuse back the dendritic cell to the patient. The other one is adoptive T cell transfer. This is you take out the T cells from the blood and educate them with a peptide vaccine derived from WT1, then activate the T cells and infuse back to the patient. This can be very powerful because it's already, it's all go to the WT1 positive uh, tumor cell. So. Based on those approaches, there are several clinical trials in Europe, Japan, and the USA, including Dr. Lee Kru and uh, us uh, in a clinical trial with uh, all sorts of malignancy, including mesothelioma. And uh, all those clinical trials show immunogenicity and uh, suggest uh, anti-cancer activity. So among all those peptide, or we call epitope, which stimulate the CD8 T cell response, there are two epitopes are very very much, very validated and very famous. So first one, this RMF peptide is presented by HLA AO211. It's just, uh, one of the MHC class one. Uh, AO201 is predominant HLA haplotype in the Caucasian population. So this, epi this peptide vaccine has been used in uh, Europe and the US. And the other one, CMT peptide, uh, bind and uh, presented by HLA A2402, which is a predominant uh, haplotype in Asian countries. Therefore, the Japanese have done a lot of uh, the clinical trial on this using this peptide. 
So we have completed a pilot phase one trial using a multivalent WT1 peptide vaccine in patient with mesothelioma, non-small cell lung cancer, and AML. Um, this work has been published uh, in two different papers uh, showing here. And uh, now we are working on the uh, phase two randomized trial. Uh, this Hopefully I can talk about this uh, in the next year or so. So uh, we now take a, a, a new approach to generate TCR-like antibodies, and uh, this kind of antibody allow us to target intracellular tumor antigen by binding to the MHC peptide complex. So the first half of the slide I have shown previously. So basically, we generate an antibody which mimic a T cell receptor recognition, so then it can um, use antibody function to kill the tumor cells. So such an antibody, like a TCR-like antibody, can be used in the all sorts of different uh, applications. First of all, for diagnosis, if a certain fragment is very uh, immunogen immunogenic and also highly expressed in the uh, disease, then we can use it as a diagnosis and also to select the patient for immunotherapy because so far the selection of patient is always uh, based on the messenger RNA expression of the whole WT1 or um, the whole WT1 protein with Western blood. But we don't know particular, for example, this RMF for CMT epitope is presented, uh, is highly expressed and presented to the immunotherapy. So uh, the antibody itself can mediate immunotherapy through complement-dependent cytotoxicity, antibody-dependent cytotoxicity, and other mechanisms. And again, if it's not potent en enough, it can be conjugated to other agents, such as drug toxin and the radiation for therapy. And uh, we also have there is a very new technology called uh, CARS, which is called um, chimeric antigen receptor and a bispecific uh, antibody called t -bide, just to conjugate this antibody to, like, uh, to, to, to conjugate to T cell to increase the therapeutic uh, efficacy. So. Uh, in a basic study, it is an excellent tool to study antigen presentation and the immunobiology. So we are very lucky we have uh, generated a high affinity fully human IgG1 antibody, we call it ESK1, specific for the RMF peptide bound to the HLA-201 uh, molecules. This was developed by <laughs> use of phage display technology. So here, uh, I directly come to the mesothelioma uh, study. So uh, this is what we call the flow cytometry. So if anything, this peak shape, uh, shift to the right, which means this antibody bind to the tumor cell. So upper panel is a, a human mesothelioma cell line called GMN, which is HLA-A2 positive and highly expressed WT1 uh, messenger RNA. And the lower panel, the, we use a cell line called MSTO, which is WT1 positive, however, is A2 negative. The green line show the ESK1, this are antibody binding, and the blue line is isotype, it's a negative control to show that the binding is specific. Okay, if this antibody binds to the tumor cells, uh, if it has any therapeutic or killing activity against those cells, so we use uh, we test the ADCC. So this assay is you will just we mix the, uh, the tumor cells with uh, um, normal donor's uh, whole lymphocyte and add antibody to see whether antibody will uh, mediate uh, the uh, specific killing. So if you look at here again, GMN was killed and the red, yellow, green bar is using a different concentration of ESK1 and the blue bar is uh, the only the two cells without the antibody. And uh, the MSTO, again, it was a negative uh, uh, control cell line. So they showed the ESK1 actually can mediate uh, ADCC, a uh, killing against mesothelioma cells. So the, the biggest concern for uh, TCR-like antibody is uh, the complex peptide bound to the MSC class one displayed on the cell surface is uh, lower compared to the whole protein on the cell surface. So 
um, we use this uh, radio immunoassay to determine, to estimate uh, how many binding site of ESK1 on the cell surface. If you look at the three red bars, and again, the mu is the, actually it's a myeloma, melanoma cell line. So MSTO again is uh, showing this background count. And the uh, GMN again, it show like more than 6,000 of a binding site, which is enough to, for this antibody to have its immunological function. So then we will see, okay, in the test tube, we could uh, kill the tumor cells. How about in vivo, which is in the animal study? Um, this is, we introduce a gene to show the luminescence to the German cell line. Then we inject the German cell line to the immunocompromised mice. So then we will give the antibody and the uh, control antibody. So if you look at the two left panel, and which is isotype means control antibody, which has no specific uh, recognition to do the cell line. So, and if you look at the big uh, purple patch, which is showing the tumor growth, and look at the day five, day 25, it, and here we use uh, the antibody ESKM. I will explain to you about it. So then on the day 25, you will see a very little a purple patch in those antibody administered mice, uh, which show this uh, tumor growth is significantly inhibited. So this is a, a, the, the summary a graph about average uh, the photon uh, showing by this uh, luminescence assay imaging. So uh, here is bl blue line showing this isotype control. So we should it's like what tumor grow, like what it should be. Then green line is the uh, ESK1, and the red line we call ESKM. It is the ESK1 antibody, but we modified its FC portion to mediate even better ADCC. So to summarize my uh, talk is um, WT1 has all of the features of uh, an optimal validated cancer selective target. And the ESK1 is the first human IgG1 TCR-like antibody with a very high specificity and affinity. This part of the um, slide I haven't shown here. So uh, ESK1 is able to mediate ADCC against mesothelioma cells that express both WT1 and HLA2. And uh, in, vi in vivo study, in the mouse study, we show ESK1 has a potent activity against the mesothelioma cells in skid mouse uh, model. And uh, again, I didn't show the data. It's important to see whether this antibody itself can cause a toxicity in the HLA-A2 molecules. And we use uh, HLA-A2 transgenic mice. Those mice will have a uh, uh, human HLA expressed in their uh, lymphoid organs. And we haven't seen any organ-specific uptake or toxicity by either histochemistry or by the measuring the body weight and uh, all those studies. So therefore, ESK could be a novel therapeutic agent in malignant mesothelioma, cell, mesothelioma cells and mesothelioma and other uh, tumor that highly express WT1 protein. And also, it can be a proof of a concept for targeting an uh, intracellular uh, oncoprotein. So I'd like to thank for Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation and also NCI, LLSS, and the ETC, and the Lymphoma Foundation, and the DOD, which is given to Dr. Lee Krug. And uh, I'd like to thank um, the technician student in uh, MSKCC who contributed to this project, and also our collaborator, uh, which is Eureka Therapeutics, Inc. Yes. Here now that you've completed your project, you've found something that has worked in cell lines, you've tried it in an animal model, you've seen there's very little toxicity, mm -hmm. it looks like it's, it has some efficacy, so where do we go from here? So yeah, we are working with Dr. Lee Krug and we are trying to bring it to the phase one trial. Wonderful. So your mm -hmm. work then will actually translate into the clinic for yeah. patients yes. uh, in not too long a period of time, it sounds like. Uh, we, we planned that this year, hopefully it will be the, the fact. Congratulations. Thank so you so much. To the bedside quickly. That's exactly what we're looking for. Thank, Thank you, you so much.
Uh, tomorrow also, Dr. Lee Krug will be on the panel, so if you have a few other questions, maybe some of the, some of the technicalities that were missed today, I'm sure Dr. La Krug can also help. Uh, Dr. DiRenzo, uh, please um, present your work as well, and welcome. We're so glad to have you with us. I would like to thank the Foundation for uh, your support and for the possibility to um, be here and present my work. Um, okay. This. This is so this the is pointer? Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, the genome of a cancer cell uh, carries many somatic mutations that are cumulative event due to DNA damage and, defecti and uh, defective uh, um, repair processes. All the, uh, cancer, all the cancer genome carry um, an average of 48, 130 somatic alteration in each, in each tumor depending on the cancer type. However, only a minority of this mutation gives uh, a selective advantage to the tumor cells. And for this reason, those are called um, driver mutation. All the other mutations uh, do not give any advantage to, uh, for, uh, um, don't give any, do, do not play any role for tumorogenesis. Um, so mutations that occur in a statistical uh, significant subset of cancer are likely to have a role in uh, cancer uh, um, development. However, there are several examples in which or even uh, um, mutation that uh, occur in 10% uh, um, of the case or even less uh, may, have, uh, may, may be biological or clinical relevant. So the identification of specific mut mutation and uh, pathways may lead to the development of effective disease-specific therapies. We can define cohort of patient, predict the outcome in these uh, cohort of patients, and guide the therapy. Um, in the last, dec the last decade has seen uh, um, a huge uh, scientific effort to, um, be, mm, to um, completely sequence the, um, the human genome. And uh, this technique requires high tumor enriched spacement as well as control uh, germline DNA from the same indivi individual to distinguish the polymorphic variation to, from uh, somatic mutation. And uh, this technique is able to identify the single nucleotide muta uh, mutation as well as large chromosomal rearrangement and, gene fu and uh, fusion genes. However, even uh, with uh, such a powerful technique, uh, it remains difficult to distinguish the passenger mutation, so the mutation that don't give any advantage to the tumor, cell, to the tumor grow um, from the driver mutation. In the last eight years, uh, um, in uh, our laboratory has focused uh, on uh, this uh, next generation sequencing. Uh, and in particular, we have uh, sequenced four uh, um, uh, uh, transcriptome from four uh, mesothelioma tumor and uh, two controls. We have been uh, the first to publish uh, the entire genome of a mesothelioma uh, tumor. And in both cases, uh, we have been able to identify many different kinds of mutation. So again, we had the problem to try to identify which were the mutations that were giving a, se a selective advantage to the mesothelioma cells. And to attempt to identify this mutation, we tried to, rela uh, to relate their presence to clinical outcome. Um, so in, uh, when we sequenced the entire genome of um, a mesothelioma patient, we found a large deletion on chromosome 2. And this large deletion was uh, determining that the mRNA from a specific gene, DPP10, was uh, shorter than uh, the normal one. And this was reflected in a, in a truncated protein, DPP10. So we tried to study, the, we, try, we studied the expression of these genes in other mesothelioma patients, and we were able to uh, see that the expression of this gene in other mesothelioma patients was associated to outcome. For this reason, uh, we thought that uh, the whole genome sequence was uh, a good technique, a good tool uh, to identify uh, driver mutation in mesothelioma. And we decided to sequence, uh, using uh, the complete genomic platform, 10 mesothelioma tumors. And uh, um, five were epithelium, premix, and two sarcomatoid. So we had uh, all uh, the kind of, of uh, pleural mesothelioma. 
And um, at the same time, we uh, try also to um, uh, develop software programs that were able to identify mutation in this large data set. And at the same time, using different projects, we started to be interested in pathway. In fact, in, in another project, we were able to uh, find pathway that were differentially expressed in uh, mesothelioma compared to all the other thoracic malignancy. Um, when we received all the data back from this 10 genome, we had a lot of data. So we tried to, uh, to find some criteria to select the mutation that we wanted to study. And in particular, we decide, we give this criteria to this program, uh, to, the, to, the, to this um, uh, software, we decide that we wanted to study just a single nucleotide mutation. So the mutation that were affecting one single nucleotide at the DNA level. And uh, we wanted that this, uh, this uh, um, variation were present in the exomic regions, that are the regions that are transcribed in mRNA and so in protein. And we wanted that the change that we see at the, amino acid, uh, at the, the acid nucleic uh, level was reflected in a change at the amino acid level. So the change at the DNA was giving a different protein, a, protein, a muted protein. When we give this criteria to, this, to our software, the software was able to identify 120 single nucleotide variation in this 10 genome. So we went to validate this sequence in, this, in the original 10 genome and their uh, normal control from the same individual. And we found that 84 of them were tumor specific. So the mutation was in the DNA uh, tumor, but was not in the normal tumor from the same individual. Instead, the, um, 36 of them were we called single nucleotide polymorphisms because they were present in the tumor and in the normal of the same um, patient. And so we decided to not study the, this mutation um, further. At this point, we wanted to identify uh, the driver mutation uh, among these 84. So again, we come up with criteria. We decided to look for genes that were mutated in more than one of the 10 sequ um, sequence and the tumor pair. Another criteria was to look for genes that were listed in the COSMIC database. The COSMIC database is an online database where there are all the genes that have been um, related to cancer. And in particular, in this database, there is also a shorter list of genes that have been validated to play a role in cancer. And then we were uh, look for genes uh, we, were, uh, map, we decided to map these genes in pathways and look for functionally related gene set. And I'm going to, to explain you more uh, about this later. So first we look for genes mutated in, wo in more than one of the, of the 10 pairs. And we found that two mesoteliomas had mutation in TP53. And that these two mesoteliomas were sharing the same clinical characteristic. So we, TP53 is a well-known tumor suppressor gene. TP53 is the most frequently alterated uh, gene in human cancer. So we were surprised about uh, uh, this uh, finding, and we went back uh, through the literature to try to understand uh, what other scientists uh, have done about uh, TP53 before us. And this is a long list, but when we look at this list, we found uh, that uh, most of the study were conducted in a tumor cell line, in mesothelioma tumor cell line. There are just uh, two um, pretty big studies. Oh, sorry. One from Michele Carbone in 97, with, uh, where, where he analyzed 29 um, solid uh, mesothelioma tumor, and one uh, from uh, um, Mark Laudani group from last year, where um, they analyzed 53 solid, uh, solid tumors. And in, uh, in both cases, they found that a very small percentage of uh, mesothelioma had the TP53 mutated. So we decided that uh, was maybe the case to look uh, at the big, bigger cohort of patient. And for this reason, we had in the lab two different cohort of samples, and we analyzed 235 mesothelioma samples for TP53. We found that the average of mutation on TP53 was between 13 and 15% um, of the patient. So this is just a, um, 
just to give you an idea. This morning, um, uh, Dr. Tess has uh, said that uh, um, just one case of uh, mesothelioma patient uh, has shown a germline mutation of uh, TP53. Instead, we have found in our group at least uh, two germline mutation. And we have all kinds of mutation that uh, have been described and novel mutation in TP53. Just to, um, to give you an example of what we are uh, doing, uh, I mean, in the first panel, uh, we have uh, the tumor DNA from uh, a patient, a normal DNA, and this is the, uh, the normal sequence. When we look at the tumor DNA, we found that, two sequ that the two sequences are overlapping each other, and uh, we have uh, that in, uh, there is the normal one, but there is a new one, where this A is now next to this T. So these uh, 18 bases are missing. But when we look uh, at the tumor cDNA, that is the, uh, the allele that is expressed, and so it's translated in protein, we have uh, just uh, the mutated sequence. And uh, this is another example. Again, we have the G in the blood DNA, but in the tumor DNA, we have a G and a C. We have a G in the D in blood DNA, and here we have an A and a C, and again, this G is changing in A. So what we are thinking now is that uh, there is a subgroup of mesothelioma patients that are carrying TP53 mutation. And at the moment, uh, all our data are to the statistician. And, uh, I mean, uh, this person will decide if uh, what we think is happening is true or is not true. Um, then uh, another uh, criteria to select, for, uh, to select uh, um, uh, driver mutation was uh, to map uh, the 84 mutation genes that we have found in pathways. Again, this is a very schematic representation of a cellular pathway where we have a um, membrane receptor, um, a signal arrived from outside the cells. So the signal binds the receptor. There is a cascade of events that ends with the activation of specific genes. But the truth is that the reality uh, of what happened in the cells in signal in signal impact in uh, signal impact is more complex. What we have is a situation of this kind where there are many different genes uh, of protein uh, that are affecting uh, this pathway and uh, are modulating this pathway. So our idea was, uh, can we identify mesothelioma patients uh, that have mutated different genes, but all these genes are related to the same pathway? And for this reason, with the help of the uh, Center of, Co of uh, Computational Biology at Dana Farber, we map all our, path all our genes in pathway, and again, what we um, found was that this situation, these colored bar are our 10 patients, and we have that, that different patient and mutation in different pathway, but they are all related um, to each other. This is a, another pathway, and again, we have that different patient and that have different mutation, but again, they are all connected to, the, uh, to this pathway. But what is, uh, it, it has been more interesting for us is that we have been able to identify a small part of a pathway where five mesothelioma patients are carrying six, uh, a mutation in six genes of this small pathway. In particular, this is a receptor, and this is a receptor, a membrane receptor, uh, receptor that is well known to play a role in uh, tumorogenesis. And uh, this receptor is mutated in uh, a, a, a hereditary disease, and there are drugs available for this receptor. So what we are doing right now, we are trying this drug on the mesothelioma cell line in the lab to see if we are able to kill cells using these, uh, these, uh, these drugs. And at the same time, we are analyzing all these genes in a, in a, in a cohort of 150 patients, and we have already identified a small, um, um, few patients have carrying a mutation in this gene, and this gene is a gene that is listed in the cosmic database, so it's, we know that is uh, playing a role in uh, tumorogenesis, and we have also some congenital um, mutation in, um, in a couple of patients for this gene. Um, so, what is next? We are using uh, this 10 mesothelioma uh, DNA uh, to um, 
uh, as a, a part of study uh, to find the tools to identify the driver mutation. And so what we are doing right now, we are doing a copy and um, a number analysis in this temptation. So, so we are checking which kind of deletion or amplification uh, this patient have in the, the chromosome. And we are related this, uh, these uh, data to expression data. We have a cohort of 150 um, mesothelioma um, for validation, and we have all the clinical data. And at the same time, because we really think that we are having a very good result with the sequencing, we have, again, um, world genome sequence data from additional 20 pair of uh, uh, mesothelioma um, genomes, and we have uh, um, uh, back in the lab uh, RNA sequence data from 100 um, uh, tumor normal pairs. Um, what, again, uh, this is a very schematic representation, what we are hoping to do, let's say that those are three different uh, uh, pathways. Uh, what uh, we are hoping to do is to identify um, mesothelioma um, uh, patients that are uh, mutation in different pathways, and we want to like to relate these, uh, um, these uh, patients to, we would like to find uh, some commonality in, uh, in the clinical characteristic of this patient. So we can, we can maybe uh, guide the therapy specifically to the pathway that are affected. And uh, I would like to thank all the people that have helped me on this, um, on this project. Thank you. So, Asunta, I guess my question to you would be, um, you know, when we look at genetics and we look at, like, now trying to map out the genome, when you're finding these driving mutations, something that really, you know, creates and causes the cancers to grow and to be driven, discoveries in other cancers, which are a little further ahead of us, once you've identified some of these mutations, you'll be able to translate some of the work from other cancers into oh, yes, mesothelioma. Yes. So obviously then this is something that's going to really be able to be translated again. Yes. Wonderful. Yes, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so Dr. Mark Landry is going to be speaking now uh, from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Thank you, Mary. Thank you to the foundation for your support. Um, I'm afraid you're going to have to uh, sit through one more talk about BAP1. Uh, but as you'll see, we're all taking different uh, approaches to, to BAP1, trying to, to mine BAP1 for uh, new insights and new strategies to, to battle mesothelioma. That was not the button to push. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so just kind of as a, as a more general kind of reminder, as, as we've been talking about BAP1 in particular, but now you just heard the uh, same uh, issue with P53, cancer genes can be mutated either only in the tumor cells or they can be mutated in every cell of, of your body, in which case they predispose to cancer development. Um, so the focus of our group has always been on the former category, on, on what are called uh, somatic alterations in cancer genes, not so much the uh, inherited um, uh, germline alterations in cancer genes. But the BAP1 story is, of course, a, a great um, kind of example of how these two uh, become interconnected. Okay, I'm definitely not doing the right thing here. Ah, here we go. So, um, one of the reasons that we look for specific genetic alterations in tumor cells is because there's a growing recognition that if you understand what has gone wrong in a particular cancer cell, you may be able to uh, uh, pick a specific drug that will block that abnormality. And this has been featured uh, in, in uh, various uh, articles that have been describing this new paradigm of uh, cancer therapy. And some of the major examples are, are in, in other cancers. So perhaps the, most, um, the best known example at this point is in lung cancer where uh, mutations in the uh, EGFR gene 
uh, are associated with uh, dramatic responses to uh, drugs that block the function of the EGFR gene. So the, the concept is that we need to understand what drives each particular cancer and then use that understanding to pick the best, most rational drug that will stop the growth of that cancer. Uh, one of the issues with um, some cancers, such as mesothelioma, uh, is that these are cancers in which, uh, if you look at their chromosomes, there are many, many chromosomal abnormalities uh, in, the, uh, in the mesothelioma cells. Uh, so it's, it can be hard to pick out which are the most important ones. And the, um, there, there's been work over many, many years um, uh, studying the genetic abnormalities in mesothelioma cells. Um, uh, much of this work's been, been done by uh, Joe Testa over the years, including uh, the first identification of uh, the P16 deletions that are extremely common in mesothelioma, as well as the uh, NF2 losses on chromosome 22 that are perhaps the second most common um, uh, cancer gene that we know of or that we knew of before BAP1 in, in mesothelioma. Uh, so now, a couple of years ago now, uh, we uh, did a study. I won't go through the details of how we, uh, we did this, um, which pointed to a, yet another tumor suppressor gene, another cancer gene on, on chromosome 3, p, uh, on the short arm of chromosome 3, 3P. Uh, and that turns out to be the third most common cancer gene that we know of presently in, in mesothelioma. So this is one way of, of um, making sense of those, um, those karyotypes, those jumbled up chromosomes in mesothelioma cells. Uh, we're, we use molecular techniques to tell us which regions of the genome are gained and which are lost in each tumor. And then when you, we, when you add that up across, let's say, 53 tumors, uh, you, you become, you start seeing um, kind of sense out of, out of nonsense or order out of disorder. Uh, and you see some regions that are always lost, some regions that are always gained. And this is a way of, of showing that. This uh, is a plot from chromosome one. So here, what we've done is, is as if we lined up all the chromosomes, uh, kind of, kind of uh, tail to end across the genome from chromosome one uh, to chromosome 22. Uh, and the regions that are more frequently uh, gained are above and they're plotted in red and the regions that are frequently lost are plotted in blue uh, and uh, the higher the, 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 the bar, the more frequent that event is. So as I've told you, the, the most frequent uh, genetic event that we know of in mesothelioma are these uh, losses of both copies of this uh, gene P16 that's involved in uh, regulating um, how cells proliferate. The second most common uh, gene that's lost is in this rather large region of chromosome 22, the NF2 gene. Um, I won't have time to talk about that. And then uh, BAP1 is on the short arm of chromosome 3 and turns out to be the uh, third most common uh, gene that's lost in uh, mesothelioma. So uh, this the, the, these were the data from our study. Um, so these are now the 53 mesotheliomas that are li lined up here. Uh, and each, each row is one mesothelioma. And if you look at this region of chromosome three, uh, the blue part indicates which piece of that chromosome was lost in, in each individual tumor. And you see that they're all kind of lined up at, uh, at uh, the location of BAP1. And you can also see uh, the losses by different techniques. So uh, this is what uh, BAP1, uh, the, the dark brown staining of the nuclei and the tumor cells here indicates that BAP1 is not lost in this tumor. Uh, the absence of staining shows that there's BAP1 loss in this tumor. Or we can look at it by, uh, fl with fluorescent probes as well. So all in all, this uh, turned out that uh, 20 to 25 percent of mesotheliomas have mutations in this, uh, in, in BAP1. Uh, 30 percent have a loss of, just loss of the gene, uh, of at least one copy of the gene. 
So in all, 42% of cases had either a mutation or loss or both, uh, making it the third most commonly altered uh, gene in mesothelioma. And in the same study, we, we looked at some other genes of interest, um, and uh, you just, uh, as was just mentioned, we did find uh, three uh, TP53 mutations, for instance. So this, I'm sorry to show you so many different kinds of ways of looking at the same information. Uh, so in this case, each column is, a, is a, a patient's tumor, and if there's a mutation in a particular gene, that box is colored. So it gives you an, an idea of how often these mutations occur uh, in the same tumor in a given patient. So you can see that uh, out of these 53 uh, patients, almost every tumor had a mutation in one of these three uh, top three genes. Uh, it's a very small number of tumors that don't have mutations in these genes. And as you, you heard very nicely this morning, um, at, at the same time, um, Dr. Harbour's group discovered um, mutations in BAP1 in, in uh, ocular melanomas. And then more recently, it's also been identified as a uh, significant uh, tumor suppressor gene in uh, kidney cancer, where, where it occurs in about uh, 8 to 15 percent of uh, one of the uh, major subtypes of kidney cancer. So we've uh, been pursuing this on, on several fronts, not, sh not just my own lab individually, but the whole team at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, and I'll briefly tell you about some of these efforts. Uh, I've indicated uh, the ones that are uh, directly supported by uh, MARF. So uh, in the first part, I want to tell you about um, our analysis of um, uh, clinical and pathologic differences in tumors that have BAP1 mutations versus tumors that don't. Uh, and this was an analysis done by Marjorie Zotterer in, in our oncology group. And I'm just cutting to the chase here. Um, so what Marjorie did was um, comparing the uh, 24 uh, patients whose tumors had BAP1 mutations. So again, we're still talking about just the mutations in the tumor cells themselves, not the germline mutations. So 24 BAP1 mutant tumors uh, versus um, 97 tumors in which we could not identify a BAP1 mutation. And the only uh, clinical difference that we could find here uh, was a smoking history. So patients whose tumors had BAP1 mutations were more likely to have a smoking history. And so this is perhaps giving us a hint that uh, there's a cooperation between smoking, uh, smoking carcinogenesis and uh, uh, BAP1 mutations. Um, although we did look at the pattern of mutations in BAP1, uh, and we can't, w w they don't look like they're directly caused by cigarette smoke because that those mutations have a particular kind of pattern that we don't see, but there it does seem to be some kind of uh, cooperation there. Uh, and we, um, did not see an excess of either family history of mesothelioma, family history of cancer, or personal history of cancer uh, in these patients. And that's just to kind of uh, reiterate that um, the BAP1 germline syndrome is still, we think, accounts for only a small proportion of mesothelioma. And that's a, a good thing to uh, keep in mind. Another uh, observation that's uh, kind of, you know, intriguing, we don't know what to make of it, uh, is that when you look at uh, survival, the impact of BAP1 mutation on survival, um, we, we do not see any um, effect on survival, meaning um, these patients do as badly as the average uh, mesothelioma patient. This is in contrast to, for instance, renal uh, kidney cancer. Uh, in which uh, BAP1 mutated patients uh, do worse. And you've already heard from Dr. Harbour that patients with ocular melanoma and BAP1 mutations uh, do worse as well. So we're not sure why we're not seeing a direct you know, survival difference in mesothelioma. Maybe it's because you know, all of mesothelioma is, is such a, an aggressive disease uh, to begin with. 
Uh, so the, the second part that uh, we've been working quite a bit on is um, uh, uh, trying to understand uh, what BAP1 is doing in the cell. So uh, this is from a recent review um, that, that we wrote, um, and it, it outlines, so I, I guess I should preface this by saying that we still have a very kind of incomplete um, understanding of what BAP1 is doing in the cell. Uh, and, uh, you know, things are still being discovered and will be discovered about its function. Uh, so three areas where it's believed to function are shown here. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk really only about these, these two parts. I won't, I won't really mention the, uh, its involvement in uh, DNA repair. So, this is kind of a simpler, simpler version of the previous diagram. Uh, what, what we think is happening is that uh, BAP1 um, is involved in regulating um, whether uh, particular genes are turned on or off in, in the cell. And it's doing this uh, through possibly two different mechanisms. Um, so the, the turning on and off of genes is called uh, gene expression, regulation of gene expression. Uh, the other aspect where BAP1 may be involved is in repairing damaged DNA, and this is still, this is, this is even more unclear than uh, this part uh, at the moment. So in terms of how BAP1 uh, regulates gene expression, uh, one of the major ways uh, seems to be through chromatin modifications. So chromatin, um, Chromatin is the combination of DNA with the proteins that it's wrapped around. So uh, DNA is um, actually doesn't, um, your, your DNA in your, uh, the, that encodes your genome isn't uh, free in the uh, cell nucleus. It's wrapped around these proteins called histones that have a very uh, defined structure. And one of the, the things that's been worked out in, in the past uh, decade or so is that uh, these, these proteins called histones uh, have these modifications, these little tags of other uh, chemical, you know, uh, uh, compounds, uh, acetyl groups, uh, methyl groups, and so on, that actually have an effect on whether that gene that's wrapped around this histone is expressed and uh, is uh, producing a protein or not. So there's a whole set of these histone modifications that are associated with activating the gene, and there's another set that are associated with um, uh, repressing the gene or, in, or uh, reducing its expression. And uh, one way of thinking about this is that it's like a little barcode at each histone that is read and it provides instructions on whether this, uh, this gene should be uh, expressed or not. So uh, it's, it's thought that BAP1 somehow um, interferes with this proper regulation of these, uh, these histone uh, tags. And the tag that it's uh, involved with in particular is the uh, UB tag or ubiquitin tag. So it's, it's known that um, BAP1 is involved in uh, removing these ubiquitin tags from histones. Uh, and it's kind of a, a back and forth process because it's actually um, the same tags are con continually being put back on by other pro protein complexes. So there's a kind of a, a steady state of uh, either you, you have enough of these ubiquitin tags on the histones or not. Uh, so clearly when, when BAP1 is lost, um, there's an expectation that there will be more uh, ubiquitin tags because they're not being removed normally. Uh, so how are we looking at, uh, looking at these? Uh, we're using a technique called uh, chromatin uh, immunoprecipitation and next-gen sequencing. Uh, so basically, you have uh, proteins that are uh, in contact with DNA. Uh, if you share the DNA, and then uh, um, you cross-link the proteins to the DNA, you shear it, you use an antibody to that protein, 
and then you, you iso use that antibody to uh, isolate the pieces that are stuck to the, of DNA that are stuck to this protein, and then you sequence these pieces and it tells you where that protein was at the moment that you, um, you uh, treated the cells. So we've been doing that uh, for BAP1 as well as many of these chromatin modifications and as well as the proteins that uh, wor work with BAP1 to, to do these uh, modifications. And this is just an example of, of what the data look like. Um, not, I don't want to, to go through this in great detail, but uh, these, these lines are these uh, bits of DNA that are pulled down in this process and they tell us that uh, BAP1 is sitting at these pe uh, places in the genome. Uh, and we also know from our other uh, experiments that, uh, for instance, this is also coincides with places where this, um, seems to have cut something cut off here, uh, where this uh, ubiquitin tag is present in the genome uh, and so on. So we're kind of piecing this together uh, we've already determined that BAP1 is present at over uh, a thousand different places in the genome. Um, Ninety-four of these uh, are uh, at uh, genes themselves. Uh, so we've identified uh, 94 genes that are uh, bound by BAP1 and presumably uh, regulated by uh, BAP1 in, in, uh, in cells. Uh, these, um, and this shows that these, um, uh, the sites where BAP1 is located in the genome are also sites that are um, uh, subject to, uh, that have uh, the H, the, the ubiquitin tag on the histones, uh, as well as uh, another, the, the sites where there's another transcription factor that associates with BAP1 called HCF1. Uh, we're also able to look at these pieces of DNA where BAP1 uh, sits or is found and look at whether the sequence is, is different from the average DNA sequence, and it is. Uh, so uh, sites where BAP1 is found have this particular uh, type of sequence. And so the size of the letters indicates how often it's, it's found. So this GGAA sequence is actually a very uh, well-known sequence in the genome uh, because it's the binding site for certain <coughs> uh, proteins that regulate gene expression called the its uh, transcription factors. And this was interesting because at the same time, uh, th we, uh, this paper came out from a group working in uh, leukemia that also found that this uh, GGAA site is where BAP1 is found uh, in the genome. So we're still trying to understand what this means, but this is definitely telling us something about how uh, BAP1 works. Um, so I've, I've kind of gone over some of this already. And we're uh, now really in the midst of uh, integrating all these data uh, to get a better picture of, of what this means for the, the cancer cell. Uh, last part of this part, I just want to mention uh, the other effort that uh, we're working on, which is to screen for synthetic lethal targets. Uh, and by synthetic lethal targets, I mean the, the concept is that um, when a, a cancer cell is, um, uh, is let's say, uh, turns, uh, becomes carcinogenic because of a genetic alteration in, in a given cancer gene, uh, that cancer gene is no longer doing something that it was doing before properly. Uh, and therefore, that, that cancer cell may, may develop an Achilles heel so that uh, if you, um, if you previously had two different genes that were kind of necessary for cell survival that were doing a particular function, one of them, uh, you lose one of them, you still have the other one. However, in a cancer cell, if one of those genes becomes a cancer gene and really stops functioning in, in its previous function, now the cancer cell is entirely dependent on um, the other gene that was uh, doing this. Uh, and therefore, if you now find what this gene is and, and block that gene, you may be able to, to kill the cancer cell. So it's a concept that uh, is um, been uh, developed in, in other cancers uh, very successfully. So we're, we're 
uh, setting up to do this. Uh, the first step to in doing this uh, is to, uh, was to uh, engineer uh, a pair of mesothelioma cell lines uh, that are completely identical except that uh, one member of the pair has a BAP1 inactivation uh, and the other one has a normal BAP1 function. So if we uh, screen this pair of cell lines uh, with either drugs or other compounds uh, to block gene function, we can begin to uh, identify genes that might fulfill this model of uh, synthetic lethality uh, for BAP1. So this is uh, obviously a part of a, a large effort uh, at uh, MSKCC uh, in mesothelioma uh, that includes um, other aspects that you've already uh, heard just before. Uh, and these are some of the key people who are involved in, in, in the BAP1 part of the uh, work. In the last few minutes, I just wanna uh, talk about something else that is um, not uh, from our lab in particular. Uh, and that's the, uh, the notion that you know, we've, we've um, discovered three important cancer genes in, um, in mesothelioma over the years. Um, but it's not, we don't, there's no, no reason to think that this is, this is the end. There's no reason to think that we know everything about the genome of mesothelioma cells. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, the sequencing capabilities uh, have uh, uh, become much more um, uh, powerful in the past few years uh, so that uh, um, the, the idea of sequencing um, mesotheliomas uh, completely is much more feasible. Uh, and you've heard an example of that uh, just a few minutes ago. So just to give you an idea, um, so the human genome is uh, 3,000 megabases or three gigabases. It's uh, three billion letters. Uh, so these sequencers now can uh, produce an enormous amount of sequence such that what took the Human Genome Project uh, $3 billion to do uh, in the 1990s uh, can be done today for $10,000. So this has really transformed the way we approach uh, cancer uh, because there's no reason not to find out every last mutation that's present in a given cancer. Uh, and this rate of this technological progress is, is moving even faster. So uh, sequencers that can do a human genome in a day uh, and the, the cutest one is this sequencer that uh, plugs into your USB port. Um, I haven't seen that actually sold yet, but it's, uh, it's very, uh, it seems very nifty. Uh, so there's actually now a, um, a, a large effort to uh, sequence uh, pleural mesothelioma. It's a joint effort of the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is um, in turn, a joint effort of the National Cancer Institute and the National Human Genome Research Institute that includes a network. It supports a network of uh, genome centers, both uh, sequencing centers and data analysis centers, and, and we are one of the data analysis centers in, in the PCGA project. Uh, and it's also joint with the, the International Cancer Genomics Consortium. Um, so the, the TCGA has a systematically um, performed the complete comprehensive genomics of um, many of the major cancers. And here's a, a list that's probably already out of date. Um, so this was the original list. As you can see, uh, mesothelioma was not on it. Uh, but the, um, the NCI did hear uh, the uh, concerns and therefore uh, initiated a so-called rare tumor project uh, which included uh, less common tumors and uh, um, I was one of the people who lobbied to, to include mesothelioma on this list. Uh, the original goal was to sequence 50 mesotheliomas. Uh, now they're hoping to, to uh, get that up to 200 cases. Uh, may, that may not be so easy. Um, the TCGA is an extremely um, 
it, it's really uh, state of the art uh, uh, network for doing this. Uh, there are many uh, quality control steps and then the data are generated by the top centers in, in the US and abroad uh, and then analyzed by the, the top uh, bioinformaticians and researchers. So it's really uh, a, a very high quality uh, product that comes out at the end. Uh, just in the past uh, couple of years, they've uh, re uh, released the results of the ovarian cancer analysis that was very illuminating, and more recently of the uh, squamous cell lung cancer analysis. Uh, so the, um, the challenge now is to uh, collect enough uh, ultra high quality mesothelioma samples to uh, make this project a success. Uh, and uh, the, the challenge is that the, the criteria for the samples are very high, so they have to be uh, untreated, uh, no prior treatment, snap frozen, uh, relatively large uh, tumors. Uh, they have to have ma match normal uh, and good clinical annotation. Of course, all the paperwork has to be in place. Uh, so, uh, and there has to be a relatively little uh, necrosis. So, so, so these are uh, all criteria that cause uh, many samples to be eliminated. Uh, they've begun accruing samples, so 52 samples have been received, uh, but uh, actually only 11 of these 52 passed the uh, QC, the quality control needed to uh, move on to sequencing. So we're still in the phase where we are really uh, looking for high quality mesothelioma samples. Uh, and uh, if you have a good source, uh, please uh, email me or come and see me, and I will put you in touch with uh, the people at the NCI. The, the part that I didn't say is, is that this is uh, free, so to speak. Um, so the NCI has the money for this. They, if, they will, if, if we don't find enough mesothelioma samples, they will use that money to sequence another cancer. So it's just, it's up to uh, us uh, to, to, to um, uh, identify the samples and send it to them. Uh, there's no additional money that needs to be raised for this particular effort, which is a kind of a, 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 nice, a nice change. So um, these are some of the contact points for this particular effort. Uh, Kenna Shaw is uh, the director of TCG at the NCI. And then um, uh, four of us have uh, come together to um, try to, to get this project uh, going. So with that, thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I don't have any questions for you. I just have a huge thank you for your interest in mesothelioma, for your work with the, uh, with the banking. And again, this is just, just really stresses the point of the need to really have all mesothelioma people seen by specialists. Because if you see a non-mesothelioma expert, this will never happen. So we really need to get the word out. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, the next speaker will be Dr. Wang. Uh, Dr. Wang is actually working at, uh, <laughs> at UPenn. I'm sorry, Dr. Wang, please join us. <laughs> He's a protege of uh, Dr. Steve Albelder, who served on the uh, Scientific Advisory Board for the Foundation for many years. Welcome. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, uh, thank the Foundation for the support. Um, oops. So today I would like to talk about personalized medicine uh, for mesothelioma patient receiving chemotherapy. Um, so why do we need personalized medicine? I think you don't need me to tell you like each and every patient is unique. And we have to understand uh, what's the difference between each patient and also what's the factor may influence the therapeutic outcome. So then we can design a strategy to overcome that um, resistance and imp improve the therapeutic outcomes. So the personalized medicine will allow us to identify each individual. Uh, see who might be more suitable for uh, different type of treatment, then we can assign the best treatment regimen to achieve the maximum uh, response with um, minimal uh, toxicity. 
So as you may heard from Mary and other speakers early on, the, uh, the standard of care for patients with unresectable um, mesothelioma is cisplatin plus pemetrexate. Um, also, this, this is a major advance in the mesothelioma treatment, but the response rate is only about like 40%, and the median survival is only like 12 months. So clearly, there's a huge room for improvement. So the goal of my project is to uh, identify the patient who might be more suitable to be treated with platin plus pemetrexate and ultimately uh, um, define a better uh, strategy to overcome this um, um, chem chemo resistance and improve the therapeutic outcomes. So how can we identify patients who might be more suitable or susceptible or resistant to chemotherapy? And a potential solution is to find a predictive uh, therapeutic biomarkers. Uh, a biomarker, as you heard earlier on, is a term often used to refer to a measurable characteristic that reflects the severity or presence of some, dis uh, some disease state. And we are looking for a biomarker that will give an indication of the probable effect of the treatment on a patient. So the pre predictive biomarker helps to assess uh, the most likely response to a particular treatment type. So the question is, is there a biomarker that we can use to predict the response to standard chemotherapy? And we approach this question by studying many uh, mesothelioma cancer cells derived from patients. And we then give the, the cells um, to um, a dose of chemotherapy that's similar to what we could achieve in patients. We then determine if the cells are, can be killed by, the, uh, by, by this dose of chemotherapy, hence they are sensitive, or if they are not killed. So this is just a simplified diagram showing what I just said. So we isolate the cells from different patients uh, and then give a single dose of a pemetrexate, cisplatin, or gemcitabine, which are the standard chemotherapy that we use in clinic. And then we found some of the cells can be killed by the chemotherapy, but the other cells cannot. So we then group the patient into two, divide the patient into two different groups. One is chemotherapy sensitive group, and the other one is resistant group. So we then screen those cancer cells for activation of different, um, kin some key signaling pathway known to potentially affect the cell uh, survival, cell death, or response to stress, and to determine if we can find a pathway that predict their response to chemotherapy. So in our screen, we actually discover one pathway that seems to be highly predictable uh, or predictive of the response to chemotherapy, which is the type 1 interferon pathway. And interferons are cytokines. They are important to our body in terms of viral, uh, well, to fight against the viral infection. So after viral inf infection, the interferons are made in large amount by our white blood cells. And this interferon can activate a receptor that's presented on the surface of our cells uh, all over our body. And this activation will set off a signal pathway that can um, help us to fight against the virus. So we found the tumor cells that lacking of this pathway were somehow very sensitive to chemotherapy. Conversely, cells uh, where this pathway has activated all the time uh, were very uh, resistant to chemotherapy. We also found that this difference could be detected by lacking one of the key components on this pathway called P48. So this is a diagram showing what I just said. So during a viral infection, we found the chemotherapy or chemo resistant cells um, they were somehow protected by this interferon pathway, uh, activated pathway, but in the chemo uh, sensitive cells, which is missing one of the key component protein, P48, so somehow this pathway cannot be activated, so the virus will kill the cells and then spread into other part of the body. So based on this, we test the idea that we might be able to use the P48 as a marker to predict the therapeutic response to chemotherapy. And this can be done easily uh, in a laboratory by just simply stain the tumor uh, biopsies. So we'll, 
we are very fortunate to get the uh, tumor biopsy from our Italian collaborator, Dr. Julia Stella. Um, so we sent the tumor samples uh, to our research core to stand for P40 expression and divide into two different groups. So we found there's a group of patients that do not have the tumor expressing P40A. And the other group of, um, the other group of tumor cells, um, or the patient with tumor cells that express P48. So the question is how well did this two group of patients respond to the ke chemotherapy? So firstly, we look at the uh, patient with high P40, P48 expression. And just like what you saw earlier, um, the response rate is very similar to, uh, to what has been reported before, uh, which has a median survival of 12 months or, or less. But if you look at a patient's tumor with low P40 expression, it seems like they are um, responding much better than, than, the, than the other group, which give, uh, which give a, 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 a eight months uh, longer survival. So in summary, we believe we have found a potential biomarker that may be able to predict the response of the patient to chemotherapy. So over the next year, we plan to validate this marker in a larger subgroup of patients. So what would be the implication of this study? So this may identify a group of patients who may need higher doses or longer duration of the therapy. This may also identify a group of patients who should be targeted for new drugs or new therapies. And by taking this interferon, interferon pathway, we might be able to develop or find a new approach to treat uh, the patient might be, who might be more uh, resistant to chemotherapy. And actually, there are a number of drugs being developed for cancers like leukemia and also for inflammatory disease that target different parts of the interferon pathway, JUK1 inhib inhibitor, state inhibitor, TYK2 inhibitor, or some people even use uh, anti-interferon beta antibody to block, uh, the, block the ligation of the interferon protein to the receptor. And for my study, I start with just using a genetic approach, a molecular approach to deplete the P48 inside the cells, inside the cells of what well, that they are resistant to chemotherapy and want to see how well they respond to chemotherapy. So by using a molecular approach to lower the P48 level in the chemo resistant cells, we're able to somehow improve the chemotherapy. So this is untreated control and a, a high dose of chemotherapy didn't really kill many cells. And then when we inhibit P48 inhibition, we could somehow kill some cells. And if you combine both of them, we can kill more uh, cancer cells. And I have to say, this is not the best result that we got, because we found if we did delete or somehow decrease the P48 too much, we kill the cells, we kill the cancer cells by itself. So, in this study, we, do, we are just looking for a synergistic or ad additive effect between um, the chemotherapy and the um, molecular approach. So we know there are still a lot to be done. So over the next 12 months, we'll try to investigate different strategies to block the interferon pathway to overcome the chemo resistance. So we believe there's always hope for better treatment and better life. So lastly, I would like to thank the people um, uh, in, in our lab and also at, in the hospital of U University of Pennsylvania who helped me to, to conduct this study. And also we'd like to thank the patient who provide us the samples to study for the disease and how to improve the, the treatment. And also the donors and the MARF grant for the financial support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wang. It was very clearly presented. I think everyone really understood this presentation. Um, great work. And are you going to stay focused on mesothelioma research? Because yes. we can use you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, we now have uh, Dr. Nadia Zafroni, who's actually from the National Cancer Institute in Milan, Italy. So, again, a demonstration of some of the international collaborations and some of uh, Phenomenal work by women scientists in mesothelioma. I think you may have noticed it. There were quite a few women. Congratulations. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here and to show you what we have done during the last year uh, in the context of the project that has been generously financed by the Meso Foundation. We focus our attention on peritoneal mesothelioma and try to see uh, which are the potential of microRNA as possible novel therapeutic target or uh, prognostic uh, markers for the disease. Uh, diffuse malignant peritoneal mesothelioma is a, a rare tumor that develops um, from the mesothelial cells that line the peritoneal cavity. And this disease accounts for about 10% of all malignant mesothelioma. Also not uh, uh, metastatic, uh, this disease is a, 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 fatal, uh, a, a fatal one with a median uh, survival that generally then does not, uh, uh, is not greater than one year. But uh, um, relatively recently, a new integrated therapeutic approach has been uh, generated and it was uh, uh, mainly proposed uh, here in the US by Professor Paul Sugarbaker. And this uh, uh, approach uh, combines an aggressive cytoreductive surgery together intraperitoneal uh, chemotherapy at, uh, under hyperthermic condition. And the treatment consists in one hour uh, exposure to doxorubicin and cisplatin at 42, 42 degrees centigrade. Uh, many of, of the patients that are submitted to this disease uh, um, um, had a very good uh, therapeutic response, but unfortunately about 40% of the patient experienced the recurrent. And it has to be underlined that uh, um, a large group of uh, uh, meso peritoneal mesothelioma patients cannot, cannot be submitted to, the, to this uh, um, combined therapeutic approach Due, uh, due to the, uh, the time of the diffusion of the disease in the peritoneum. So the fact that for uh, patients uh, who recur after the combined surgical and chemotherapeutic uh, uh, approach or for patients which are, who are not amenable for this kind of treatment, there is uh, a is mandatory uh, to identify novel biomarkers that are able to better stratify the patient in order to select uh, those who are really um, uh, in, in the position to uh, benefit from this kind of treatment and also to identify novel therapeutic targets and to develop new novel therapeutic approaches for the others. Uh, for this study, we decided to look at microRNAs. MicroRNAs are small non-coding RNA that are implicated in the negative regulation of uh, gene expression at the post-transcriptional level. Usually, we have a gene uh, a, and uh, the, the gene is transcribed to uh, RNA messenger and the RNA messenger is translated to the protein, which are the uh, major component of the cells. In the case of microRNA, the situation is different since we have uh, the gene that is transcribed to obtain microRNA, but microRNA is not translated to give rise to protein, but uh, it, uh, it became part of a very complicated um, program that is inherently activated in the cells and is called um, and it's called uh, uh, RNA interference. And uh, the microRNA in this way is able to inhibit the translation of uh, uh, RNA messenger to proteins. Uh, in, in the last year, it has been demonstrated that microRNA play a pivotal role in very important biological processes in normal cells and I mean uh, uh, of uh, development uh, processes, cell growth and proliferation, cell differentiation, and many other. And uh, several studies have demonstrated that uh, their expression is often deregulated in a variety of human diseases, including heart diseases, neurological diseases, immune, immune function disorder, and cancer. And it has been also shown in the case of cancer that uh, there are uh, sets of microRNA which are differentially expressed in tumor compared to the normal counterpart. 
but the most important thing for our study is that uh, thus far no information concerning the expression or the role of microRNA in uh, uh, peritoneal mesothelioma is available. So the major objective of our study are three, and they are the identification of the regulated microRNA in peritoneal mesothelioma compared to normal peritoneum specimen in order to discover specific microRNA that act as key player in the, carcino in the peritoneal carcinogenesis. The second one is to identify microRNA which are significantly associated to patient prognosis in order to discover novel prognostic marker that can be used in conjunction with um, uh, currently clinically used uh, pathological and clinical uh, marker in order to better stratify the patients who will benefit from a specific treatment. And the third one is to try to functional, uh, functionally validate specific microRNA as possible novel therapeutic targets or tools for the disease in order to define the biological rationale for developing new microRNA-based therapeutics. Uh, for the po first point that is related to the identification of the regulated microRNA in the NPM, we work uh, with a, um, a case series of 39 um, peritoneal melanoma speci uh, mesothelioma specimens that uh, we obtain from patients who un underwent high pec and cytoreductive surgery in our institute. And then we also look at five normal peritoneal specimens. And uh, when we perform a genome-wide uh, microRNA expression, we found that the, uh, the normal specimen clusterized separately from mesothelioma. And uh, following several steps of statistical analysis, we were able to identify 16 microRNA that proved to be uh, very highly significantly different in uh, peritoneal mesothelioma compared to normal peritoneum. What are we, uh, what are we doing now is uh, to um, complete the technical validation of these results by using another technique that is quantitative re uh, reverse transcription P PCR. And, uh, and then um, we also are focusing, and I told you uh, uh, something about that in the last slides of my presentation, uh, on the uh, possible uh, biological roles of the most differentiated microRNA by using experimental models of peritoneal mesothelioma. Then we look at the possibility to identify microRNA which are significantly associated to patient prognosis. And for doing that, uh, we use as discovery set the, the, um, the series of 39 uh, sample from uh, peritoneal mesothelioma patient who underwent uh, um, cytoreductic surgery and high pec at our, at our institute in Milan. And we have uh, follow-up information for this patient and the median follow-up of the entire uh, group of patients was 48 months. And uh, I'll show you in the next slide, we were very uh, lucky since we were able to find out found out at least eight uh, different microRNA that prove to be significantly associated with five-year uh, disease-free uh, survival in this patient. And what we are doing now is uh, to try to validate our results in a second set of patients, uh, the validation set, that will consist in a specimen for 50 um, peritoneal mesothelioma patient who underwent the same kind of combined treatment at our institute and in our specialized center in Italy uh, in the context of the Italian Association for Integrated Local Regional Therapies in Oncology. Here are shown uh, the first four microRNA that we demonstrated, at least in the first set of patients, to be significantly associated with patient, pro patient prognosis. As you can see, uh, for all these microRNA, when we have a, uh, a patient in, uh, in which, uh, with a tumor that uh, presents a low expression of these microRNAs, we have a better prognosis in terms of uh, disease-free survival. Conversely, when we have an overexpression of these microRNAs, 
uh, the, um, the, the patient experience a worse uh, outcome. And these are the other four microRNA that uh, behave in the same way, in the sense that when the tumor uh, express a low level of this microRNA, uh, the patient experience a better prognosis. Finally, I will show you um, an example of what we would like to do or what we are uh, and now already uh, doing for the functional validation of specific microRNA to be studied as possible novel therapeutic targets or tools. And uh, uh, we, uh, for doing that, we had a problem uh, since uh, uh, there are no commercially... Ev there are... What I have to do? I try to lie. Uh, uh, no. Okay. Uh, and uh, we had a problem for doing that since there are no commercially available experimental model of peritoneal mesothelioma. And these models are also not available in uh, other uh, scientist laboratory. So we have to generate in house our own uh, peritoneal mesothelioma models. And this is the scheme that we use for doing that. Uh, we got uh, peritoneal mesothelioma samples from the patient and we disaggregate um, uh, the tumor. Uh, 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 the First of all, the pathology selected the tumor in order to provide us with a specimen that contained at least 80% of tumor cells. Then we disaggregate the, the tumor and to obtain primary culture. Then we try to establish in vitro this primary culture to obtain an established cell lines. And this established cell lines have been used uh, to uh, evaluate the effect of the modulation of microRNA in vitro. Then, in order to generate in vivo model, we injected uh, these uh, cell lines into an immunodeprived uh, um, mice in order to obtain two kinds of uh, xenograft. Subcutaneous, when we put, uh, we, when we injected the mesothelioma cells into the flank of the mice, and an orthotopic uh, model when we injected the mesothelioma cells into uh, the peritoneum. And these are the example of the two xenograph when we put uh, in the right flank of the, of the mouse, we got a tumor growing subcutaneously. And this is the typical way to grow a human tumor in uh, mice. But in order to obtain a, a tumor model in vivo, more reproducible of the characteristic of dissemination of the peritoneal mesothelioma in human, we set up uh, orthotopic xenograph model, and you can see that we have a, 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 uh, the presence of several nodules that uh, well represent uh, the distribution that is uh, typically observed in humans. Uh, then I will show you a couple of examples of microRNA that has been modulated in order to see the effect of this modulation in our experimental cell model. Uh, I show you um, MIR21 that was selected since it is one of the most overexpressed microRNA in peritoneal mesothelioma compared to normal peritoneum. And uh, this microRNA already proved to be, to be very important for other uh, disease of the gastrointestinal uh, tracts. And we try to inhibit the expression of such microRNA by using a, a lock nucleic acid that is an antisense and inhibit the expression of the microRNA within the cells. And we see that uh, such an inhibition was able to impair the proliferation of peritoneal mesothelioma cells. Uh, another microRNA that we look at uh, was MIR380 star. Uh, which is a microRNA that is uh, uh, downregulated in uh, peritoneal mesothelioma uh, that express telomerase. We, we are interested in telomerase that is an oloenzyme that is able to elongate the terminal part of the chromosome, that are the telomeres, and uh, it is responsible for the immortality 
of our cancer cells. Uh, and we are interested in that uh, since a few years ago, we published a paper indicated that in peritoneal mesothelioma, the presence of telomerase activity is a very bad prognosticator. And then since uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, in in peritoneal mesothelioma cells, uh, uh, the, this microRNA is under uh, express, we reconstituted uh, it uh, in uh, cells by using uh, transfection uh, with the precursor of the microRNA. And we're able to see that uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the reconstitution of the microRNA was able to inhibit the proliferation of the cells as a consequence of an inhibition of telomerase activity. And uh, here are uh, the preliminary results with uh, MIR-21 when these are the results of uh, um, a measurement of the expression of the microarray with uh, quantitative RT-PCR, and we were able to inhibit uh, by nine, more than 99% uh, the expression of the microRNA within the cells. And when we, we uh, transfected the cells with it, we were also able to significantly inhibit uh, the proliferation. When we try to see what happened uh, to uh, the cells uh, after uh, transfection with the, the inhibitor of the MIR-21. In the skid mice, uh, we see that all, only um, a small and non-significant inhibition of tumor growth were, were obs was observed, but uh, I have to underline that uh, this, these uh, cells were transfected with the MIR-9 inhibitor only at the beginning of treatment, a probably repeated uh, treatment has to be done. Concerning uh, the manipulation of MIR-380 star, uh, we reconstituted the microRNA, and you can see this is the level, the basal level, and this is our, the level after reconstitution, and uh, we uh, perform short-term and long-term experiment Short-term experiment, we look uh, at the effect of the uh, reconstitution of the microRNA until 72 hours after transfection. And uh, uh, in long-term experiment, we look at the, uh, the effect uh, after eight weeks. Uh, we can see that we were also able to maintain very high the expression of the reconstituted microRNA. And you can see that inhibition, the, uh, the inhibition of the proliferation which was maintained after eight weeks, uh, and it was significant, and also give rise to differences in the morphology of the cells. I am not uh, sure uh, you, uh, I mean, I'm not uh, uh, here, the, um, the slide, in, I, I'm going to present it tomorrow in the scientific session, but I have to say that uh, this inhibition of, of cell proliferation was due to a uh, microRNA induced downregulation of the catalytic component of telomerase and to, uh, to the displacement of a specific protein such as uh, POT1 by the telomer. Uh, overall, um, in summary, uh, I can say that the preliminary results from our study indicate that uh, in peritoneal mesothelioma, specific, mi specific microRNA are deregulated compared to normal peritoneum, and this could be possible novel therapeutic target. In the same way, uh, other uh, specific microRNA are significantly associated with better prognosis, and once uh, validated in a um, second independent case series, this could be uh, thought as possible novel prognostic biomarkers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. question. Um, when you looked at all the cell lines and you looked at the uh, mesothelioma, you know, the peritoneum, did you look at all the histologies? Was there epithelial, biphasic, sarcomatoid, or were these strictly epithelioid mesothelioma? Thus far, we were able to uh, establish only epithelial okay. uh, mm -hmm. cell line and to follow mm -hmm. them into the animals. It was very uh, difficult for sarcomatoid, and mm -hmm. we only had a few cases available mm -hmm. of biphasic, so we did not try with them. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We now have Dr. Yang is going to come up and uh, just, I just want to have you come up for just a minute, Dr. Yang. So, 
Um, Dr. Yang came this morning and uh, gave you know a, a sort of an overview of some of the work she's doing, but I also wanted to take a chance to really introduce you to Dr. Yang and to tell you a little bit about her work. Um, you know, she started as a young investigator working in the laboratory of uh, Dr. Michele Carbone, and she has dedicated many years now, young girl, but she's dedicated many of her, all of her years in the lab to mesothelioma. Uh, she's received some prestigious awards, and this is uh, somebody that you should know and you should speak to, and you should really um, give her a round of applause for the work she's doing, because she is advancing the science in mesothelioma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. This is a surprise. In fact, uh, I was not expecting this. Um, but I have to say a couple of words, especially I want to thanks to Mesothelioma Research Foundation. As I mentioned this morning, without uh, the support from Miso Foundation, there is no way I can generate the data, and there is no way that I can uh, win those uh, grant from the National Federal Institution or those uh, federal funding. So thank you very much, Mary and all the people. And uh, also I met a few, uh, quite a few patients, I talked with them, and they gave me also the, really the driving force, as I mentioned uh, to many of my colleagues and my students even. I said, we are here doing research to, to help people. It's not that we are trying to publish paper or get grant. No, that is not the purpose for our research. Our research is try to deliver the findings to the patient back to help more people in the society. So I, I hope that uh, really some of the um, novel research findings and discoveries will be translated into the patient bed soon. And hopefully we can really kill me so in the near future. Thank you.